<laughs> now for something completely different. <laughs> um, I don't like to be seen to be opening up a second front against Darwin when he's already got the creationists onto him from the other side. But I do think that if he was alive today, he might well have approved. Everybody has been spending millions of words talking about Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. And towards the end of that, he said, much light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. And the people who believed in Darwin were very pleased with that. They said, we've got to wait a bit longer, and he'll tell us exactly how it happened, how we became different from the apes and became the wonderful creatures that we are today. And they waited a long time. And nine years later, let me see, nine years later, he was writing to a man in France, and he said, I was so much fatigued by my last book that I determined to amuse myself by publishing a short essay on the descent of man. And now this essay has branched out into some collateral subjects. And what he ended up with was not a short essay, but a big fat book, bigger than the origin of species. <coughs> and yet, almost nothing in that book throws any light on the origin of man. So what went wrong? You would have expected, it was another three years after that letter before he brought it up, you would have expected, and I would have expected, because the whole of Darwinism is concerned to explain how you can explain an animal or a plant by reference to the kind of life it lives and the environment it inhabits. So you would have expected if Darwin writes a book called The Descent of Man, he will say, this was the environment and this was the lifestyle that changed him from an ape into a man. <coughs> you would be dead wrong. He does nothing of the kind. He says quite early in the book, um, nor will I have occasion to more than allude to the amount of difference between man and the anthropomorphous apes. Well, why is that? Why isn't he going to be talking about the difference between men and apes? The reason he gives is, well, I, I don't need to do that because Professor Huxley's done it. Professor Huxley's talked a lot about the anatomy. That is true up to a point. Huxley had talked a great deal about the difference between our anatomy and the anatomy of apes, but he has always concentrated on the similarities because the creationists were saying, no, God was made, we were made in God's image quite separately. Huxley kept on saying, no, look, we resemble them in this, we resemble them in that, look at the skeleton, look at the hands. But nobody was saying, in what ways are we different from them? And another problem that Darwin had, which he quotes in this book, another most conspicuous difference between man and the other animals is the nakedness of his skin. Whales and porpoises, Sedatia, Dugong, Cyrenia, and the hippopotamus are naked. So you say, yes, yes, go on, say some more, but he stops there. We hear nothing more about the hippopotamus. But he says to this, no one supposes that the nakedness of the skin is any direct advantage to man. His body, therefore, cannot have been divested of hair through natural selection. Not through natural selection. Through what then? So, there's another kind called sexual selection, which he had just mentioned in his first book. And now, to, if he's going to account for the nakedness, he's got to give more details about it. And because he was Darwin, once he started collecting examples of sexual selection in birds and animals, he went on and on and on and on. So the two-thirds of this book has nothing at all to do with man. And the third of it that is about man has little or nothing to do with his origins. It's about his 
taste in fashion, his dress, about the different races, about music and response to beauty. But none of this is saying why are we different from apes. It was a popular book, it was a chatty book, it was much better received than the origin of species. But he didn't sound at all certain. And when he came to explain two of the most striking differences between us and the apes, why do we walk upright and why are we naked, he dismissed them in a little paragraph each. He dismissed um, my pedalism by saying, what if it would freeze the hands? Even then, it doesn't sound very certain about it. He says, I can see no reason why it should not have been advantageous to the progenitors of man to become more and more erect. Well, that's a good point, but there were dozens of other primates who came down from the trees and walked on the ground. None of them have stood up red. Why wasn't it advantageous to them? And when he comes to explain the nakedness, he does it practically in one sentence. That man, or especially woman, became naked for purposes of ornamentation. In other words, it was sexual selection and it was being naked that made the female more desirable, and that is what he's implying. And I, I, I'm sorry to use this word, but I think that is plain silly. No other animal all the way through the mammal world for millions and millions of years, they've been covered with hair. They found ways of becoming attractive to one another, but none of them had decided Suddenly, the male decides, I don't like that female. She's all covered with hair. I'd like one with a bald body. Find me a bald-bodied female, and I will meet with her every time. And having made that decision, then the, the, the woman said, oh, OK, I'll even put up with a bald-bodied man. man as well. I, think, I, I think it is. It was the best she could do. I think if that was the best that Darwin could do, there was something seriously missing in the narrative of evolution as he was doing about it. Now, nobody complained at the time. Nobody said, well, that's silly. I don't believe in that. Because he went, kept it over it so lightly that nobody took any notice of it. And until 1930, nobody bothered to say, why, why did these things happen? Why are we so different? But then a man called Raymond Dart said, I know what happened. I have found some skeletons out on the savannah in the dry. And I believe that what happened was that the ancestors of the apes stayed in the trees, and the human ancestors moved out onto the savannah. And that was what made us different. I mean, it was so hot out there that we took our coats of fur off and we became terribly sweaty. We were the sweatiest animal in the whole of creation. Um, we sweat about, in, in a hot weather, we can sweat 12 quarts a day, which means that we have to drink 12 quarts a day as well. And for the best part of half a century, everybody believed this was the explanation of why they're different. They couldn't agree on any of the reasons why we were bipedal. There was about 12 different reasons why being on the savannah made us bipedal, or why the, being on the savannah made us naked, or why being on the savannah made us able to talk. But they all agreed that that was what had made the difference. 